On behalf of staff and students and administration, we would like to welcome all of our dignitaries, first responders, and families and friends to Great Oak High School. This morning is a somber reminder of how precious life is and how one poor decision can permanently change the outcome of a life so quickly and so catastrophically. This can happen to anybody. Students, I'm gonna to speak directly to you right now. Our challenge to you this morning is to listen carefully. Hear the messages and feelings being conveyed to you for your direct benefit. 17 years ago, when I was a teacher at Temecula Valley High School, on prom night, I lost a student, Crystal. And I will tell you, it's not something I ever, ever forget. And so the significance and power of this program, I want you to take in. So put your phone away. Take the earbuds out completely and focus in on the message this morning because this program is for you. Thank you. Calling the matter of People versus Anthony Aldana, our counsel. The defendant, Anthony Aldana, decided to have a drink of alcohol. Mr. Aldana made a mistake. This was a tragic accident. We should not punish Mr. Aldana for his wife. The defense will have you believe this tragedy was the product of a simple mistake, an accident. The reality is, this was no accident.
cans. Vodka on the bottom. Three, we have one in the front of the tow truck, two here. We have a passenger over being treated right now that says that they were also smoking marijuana. Need your food at all? You're trying? Call them up for you. Can you feel where I'm touching? Deep breath. Deep breath. I'm not hearing much air movement on that right side. You having a hard time taking a deep breath? We're gonna get you in a helicopter. We're gonna fly you over there. We wanna get you over there quickly, okay? Hello. Hi. Michelle? Yes, sir. How are you? I'm Deputy Warrop with the Tobacco Police Department. Unfortunately, I'm here to uh, talk to you about Justice. Is that your daughter? Yes, sir. Unfortunately, Justice was in a car accident and she's passed away. Time. I've got no respirations. I'm going to start bagging. Hey, so on bag the for me. Bagging. I'm getting good chest Let's go ahead and get epinephrine. Let's continue CPR. Okay. We, yes, we're going to intubate her. Let's go. I chill. We're at the two minutes. I have no respirations. Let's, let's get the so second cold. epi. Let's give the second we're epi. Keep, we're losing her. Second epi in. Check for pulses. Pulse. Check for pulse. There's no cardiac activity. No pulse. No pulse. Let's give another round of epi. Starting compression. All right, we're at. Hey, we're gonna call it. Yeah. No pulses. No pulses. Time of death, 11:35. Unfortunately, she did not make it. 
Several fatalities in the vehicle. Uh, they were ended. A car that was being loaded onto on your account, a tow truck. One, two, two three. three. No, I'm Dr. Jacobson. Thank you, sir. Are you having pain right now? Yes. Where are you having pain? Everywhere except my legs. Everywhere except for your legs. Take a deep breath for me. I want you to wiggle both your toes. Okay, there's no movement on both toes. Jeff shares. Pupils are three to two. Good. Let's go ahead and roll them off the board. Do you have any allergies to any medication? Okay. There you go. Good job. Ready? One, two, three. Move your head. Tell me when you're having pain. Any pain there? He's got pain on his lower lumbar spine. Okay. All right, go ahead and come on back. One, two, three. We're getting four. Bye, man. What's your left? Oh, the red line. Hello, Hello. Hi, I'm Dr. Jacobson. How are you? I still look better. How are you? You're uh, Angelina's mom. Angelina's mom. All right. So yes, yeah, she was in a very bad car accident. She had some okay. extreme, extremely bad injuries. Okay. Um, she had uh, quite a bit of chest trauma. Okay. Uh, Is and, she okay um, now? Well, about a half an hour ago, she um, lost her pulse. We had to begin CPR and resuscitate her. Is she okay now? We gave her several yeah. medicines. She did not respond. She passed away. I am so sorry. <laughs> this was the result of a chain of deliberate choices that the defendant made. The defendant chose to get in that car. He chose to drive under the influence of alcohol, to drive under the influence of a mind-altering substance. As the court knows, choices have consequences. But where, where was Spencer Boondock's choice in this matter? Where was Peyton Sullivan's choice? What about the tow truck driver who was also killed in the incident? The wife and the kids that he has that he will never get to see again. The defendant must take responsibility for his decisions. The people ask that you give the maximum sentence, 15 years to life. Your Honor, Mr. Aldana made a mistake. He made a mistake when he drove other students while he was under the influence and smoked marijuana. The defense asked for compassion when delivering the verdict as Anthony wants to make the most of his life. His life shouldn't be destroyed forever after one unfortunate mistake. He has never had any previous issues with school or with the law. We should not punish Mr. Aldana for his one mistake. Thank you. Uh, sir, you're going to need to stand to be sentenced. On the one hand, I, I have a young man who uh, was really at the top of his life in high school, enjoying life with friends. And on the other hand, I have a courtroom filled with family members. And while I do hope that you find redemption at some point, your brain hasn't developed enough yet as a young person. And within the next 25 years, it will develop. And then you will fully comprehend the magnitude of your actions. And at that point, uh, perhaps you will be able to seek redemption from the families, from the community that you have taken so much from. And so, sir, I am going to sentence you to 15 years to life. Uh, I, and uh, I am going to ask my deputy, at this point, sir, you're remanded into custody. 
uh, deputy, if you could please take uh, the defendant and place him into custody. At this, at this time, we would like to invite some of our students to come up and read their goodbye letters. Dear Dad, Mom, Kaylee, and Jared, thank you for everything that you have done and was preparing to do for me. I love you and everyone else. Please tell Jared that everything was all in good fun and that I, and that I miss him dearly. Tell Kaylee that I absolutely loved everything that we did together. Tell Mom that even though I'm gone, I love her. and that you too shouldn't forget Kaylee and Jared. I know that I will never see another beautiful sunset or feel, the f or feel the fierce joy that overcomes me whenever I excel at something. I will never feel the cold breeze as I drive through the night on the way home from my best friend's house. All of the little things that I will be missing, like being able to see presents that I knew were for me, I want you guys to feel those things for me. Jared, if he plays a sport, racing down the field, blowing by everyone with an adrenaline rush and everyone at his back. Kaylee, being able to belt out a tune in the shower or even just reading a book. Mom, when she can eat as much as she wants and sit at the table playing cards or even talking to grandma on the phone and you. Be there for Kaylee and Jared. It always made me happy, whether it was a bad day or whether you and mom were having a hard time. I hope that they can do for each other what I did for them and be happy. I hope that you guys cherish the feelings that you often get after a good, absolutely fantastic night's sleep. Looking back, it was always the small things that made my day. And now that I'm gone, I hope that you guys can go on feeling those same things and cherish them. I wish that I could be with you in your greatest time of need so far. Please keep moving forward and have Kaylee and Jared pursue what they love no matter what. Pop, I always did everything I thought was right. I always wanted to make the right decisions by you, to make you proud. I know that in the past times, we constantly bigger, bickered and argued, but it all seems so incredibly pointless now. I wish I was alive to have the chance to argue with you and to hear your voice. I would do anything to hear you say I love you or see you later. You were my entire world, and now because of one dumb choice, made not even by me, cost me my life. I hope that you aren't upset with me. I hope that you can be proud of me and share who I was with others. I hate to take another child from you, and I hate to do this to you, Hefe. You loved me unconditionally and showed me what it meant to have a parent that would sacrifice everything for their child. For that, my love will be with you always. Please find peace and joy. Do not let this be your end, too. Spread all the things you knew I was passionate about. I love you, Pop. I'll see you in a little while. Mom, Dad, the things you have done for me, I can't even begin to thank you for. All the money, all the time on softball, and I know you would do it all again in a heartbeat. Mom, you are the strongest woman I know. 
moving across the world to raise a family is so unimaginable to me. Working and balancing four stupid kids with their stupid sports and their stupid coaches, you would move mountains for us, and I can't think of another woman that can possibly do what you do. I can only hope that I'll be half of the woman you are today. I love you so much, and I never wanted to live in a world without you. Daddy, you are my rock. Your impact on this world is way more than we know. The lives you have changed and the lives you have saved will forever be in your debt. I was so young when you went to war, but the only thing I really remember is the feeling of your absence, and that's something I never want to feel again. You are so much stronger than I will ever be, Daddy. All the losses you suffered and all the pain you went through at such a young age pains me to even think about. And as I follow in your footsteps and become a soldier in the US Army, I hope you're proud of me because not only am I doing this to be better in my life, I'm doing this to make you proud because you are the best man on this planet, flaws and all. You two are God's gift from Earth who inspire me to live my life and not only not only be the best, but make the world a better place. You always tell me it's important to raise my kids better than the way I was raised, but honestly, I don't think that's possible because you are actually the best people I have ever met in my life. And I pray every night that God blesses us with many more years together. I love you with all my heart. To my family, I am so sorry this happened to me. Just know that I love you with all my heart. You brought me so much joy and happiness, and I am so grateful that I had you. I won't be able to hug you or kiss you anymore, but know that I am always here with you. I did not suffer, and I feel no pain anymore. You were my greatest joy and my biggest support. I knew I could do anything I wanted in this world because you believed in me and my abilities. My life ended because of a stupid choice made by someone who wanted to have a fun night and didn't want to come back and get his car the next day and not take an Uber. Because of this one life decision, I will never be able to graduate high school, go to NAU, play soccer, or become a nurse, all because of a few drinks. I always tried to make the right life choices and always did the right thing, but this was not my fault. I'm sorry you have to go on without me, but I need you to find happiness again. You can't live your life angry at someone because you can't take back what they did. You were the most important thing in my life, and I'm so sorry I took you for granted. I didn't hug you or kiss you like I should have and tell you that I appreciate everything you do for me. I can't explain how much I will miss you, but know that I will always be your guardian angel and will always be with you. God blessed me with such an amazing family, and I've had such a fulfilling life. I regret nothing, but I want you to live for me. Go see the world. Go experience and do whatever makes you happy. That is all I want for you, is to be happy. I know it will be hard to move on, but I will always be here with you, waiting till we meet again. I love you end endlessly and will miss you more than you know. I am okay, I'll always remember that. Love, Randallin. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Philip Sinangelo. Um, I'm the father of Mia Rose Sinangelo. Mia leaves behind 
her twin brother, Philip, her older brother, Nicholas and Sophia, a grieving mother, a grandmother, a Nana, and an Uncle John, and her best friend, Emily Nightingale, who is more a sister to her than a friend. Mia's great loves. Well, we didn't need a stereo in our house because Mia was constantly singing since she was a little girl. There was one time I thought someone left the radio on in their playroom and I asked my wife, who left it on? And she said, that's Mia. And I went around the corner to watch. And I, um, I knew that was Mia's gift. I will miss her singing. She loves to do musicals, 15 or more, I don't know how many. There was one time she was 14 years old and I forced her to audition for an adult musical at Temecula Valley Players and she kicked and screamed. I wanted to show her how good she really was. My wife and I took her. We had to leave. We came back like six hours later and she's jumping up and down. I got a call back for the lead. And we were sitting there talking off to the side and some of the adults heard that she was her talking when we were talking about how old she was. Amelia, you're only 14. You're only gonna get better. And I still remember, like, I can't say the words, but it was foul, but are you? You're only effing 14 years old, oh my God. I will miss your plays. Her newest love was ASL and Mrs. Santone, she loves you. At work, she would come home and tell me how she helped a, a deaf person with her sign language. And it was like the coolest thing. And then we would talk about how she could implement it in her career when she goes to college. I will miss talking about her ASL and how excited she gets. Mia's great loves. Mia endlessly loves her mother. She loves her brother, Philip, and she's very proud of how smart he is. She says it all the time. Mia loves her dogs, especially her new puppy, Romeo, and Romeo will miss you, Mia. And since coming to Great Oak, Mia saw, we saw Mia's personality for her future. She saw her future happening and because of the teachers that touched her life and showed her endless possibilities ahead. And I wanna thank you for doing that for my daughter. And thank you for the counseling who helped guide my, my Mia and her friends who stood by her through good times and bad. Thank you, Emily, for loving my Mia. I've seen Mia even grow as a young woman and for her love of the environment and whoever your AP environment teacher is, thank you. Mia is always catching us throwing away bottles now. And when we go out to eat, we ask for straws and we get dirty looks. I will miss those looks of disappointment.
I want to thank all you for her friends that stood by my daughter. I will miss you, Mia. I will miss you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brenda, and I was the mother to JT Lopez. 6,097 days. That's all we had together. 6,097 days of my life filled with love and happiness. The day you were placed in my arms was the day my life finally made sense. You were the reason I was put on this earth. Being your mother was what I was waiting for all my life before you. Your life gave me life. Your death now seems to end mine. How do I say goodbye to the one person my heart lives for? Everything that you wanted to do and everything that you wanted to become is over because of one person. That one selfish decision now rips you from me. You changed me. You changed so many people, and I was looking forward to the world where you were going to have such a big impact in it. The things you wanted to do for our country, the life of military service that ran deep in your DNA. I remember back to that summer where we did ancestry research and found out that in every generation of our family, someone served this country all the way back through the American Revolution. You were so proud of that and told me that that's what you wanted to do and that that was what you were born to do. You prove it over and over with your commitment and involvement, with your JROTC, with your coaches and teammates on the football and wrestling teams. When I got the call that morning, time stopped. I felt pulled into some vacuum where I could hear nothing. I felt nothing. Then all the, world, all the words came rushing back like a smack in my face. Car accident, drunk driving, and he just didn't make it. It's burned into my brain and I don't even remember getting into the car I just wanted to get to you. And when I got to the morgue, I didn't want to look because from that moment on, when I think of you, the first vision of you will be your cold, gray, bruised face. No longer will the first thing I see be that smile, that smile, that sparkle in your eye, and I'll never feel your arms around me when you hug me goodbye. Those memories will be there and my mind will find them again. But seeing you on that table will never leave me. I loved hearing from people, are you JT's mom? He's such a good kid, you did a good job. But you made that easy. I would tell people that you weren't mine, that you were God's and he just trusted me to care for you. But you were mine. You were the greatest accomplishment of my life, and I don't care how big you were. You were my baby, and I was blessed to be the one you called mom. I don't know how to go on anymore. I don't know where my next smile will be. It's left me and gone up to heaven with you. My son, there is nothing on this earth I love more than you. I planned on being the one waiting for you in heaven, watching over you in your life. Now I just long for the day when I get to see you waiting for me. I want to know that the breeze that brushes by is you. The whisper in the wind and the sun on my face is you. Your smile was everything to me. Your laugh would cheer me up and your smile. It would always get you out of trouble with me and you knew it. 
Your love was all I needed in this world. My little boy who grew up so much, I had to look up just to see your face. Now I will have to look down at a stone in the cold and lonely ground. I mourn the things that you wanted but no longer can have. College graduation, a naval commission, becoming a naval aviator or SEAL. That ranch you wanted in Texas and even all those bratty grandkids you threatened to give me and make me watch. I'd give anything to trade places with you so that you can live the life that you were supposed to have. Saying goodbye to you was not what I was expecting that last morning, but I thank you for that last hug and that last I love you. You looked me in the eyes and smiled and said, I love you, I'll see you later. Your cell phone, I will never close it. I don't know how many times a day I will call it just to hear your voice and pictures. You were always annoyed because I was always taking pictures of you. But Monday was the last time I took one, and it was at your tuxedo fitting for prom. We almost didn't go, and we were going to wait till Friday. I thank God for that photo. And you gave me a little bit of a smile, and that will be my most treasured memento of you. To the rest of you here, especially my son's friends, don't let his death be in vain. Remember this. Use this to remind yourself of the pain you feel right now and the pain as a parent I feel. Do not put your parents through this. Don't put parents of someone else through this. And to my son, you wanted to change the world and you did. You changed mine. <clears throat> and I will love you and remember you forever. At this time, we would like to invite Allison Pace from the District Attorney's Office to please come up and share some thoughts. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Allison Pace, and I'm a Deputy District Attorney with the Riverside County District Attorney's Office. My assignment is vehicular homicide. That means I deal with every case in this area where someone is killed because someone was driving under the influence, and I also deal with the cases where somebody was seriously injured because somebody was DUI. This reenactment was very real to me. And it was very personal to me because it was based on a true case that I handled this past year. A man by the name of Kyle Kroll, who was 28 years old and a tow truck driver, was killed by a 19-year-old young woman who made the choice to drink to the point of impairment and then get behind the wheel of her car and drive down the 15 freeway, swerve onto the shoulder, and hit Kyle as he was trying to help two stranded motorists. And as I watched the parents get up and speak, which I so appreciate them doing, because that's something that you need to understand, because that's what I see every single day. The family members that are left behind to deal with a tragedy that nobody knows how to deal with. Kyle had a family, he had friends, he had a mom who to this day is, is going to be, is she still devastated? She's always going to be devastated. It doesn't matter how long that young woman is in prison, it's not going to change anything for her. That young woman who killed Kyle was a former Great Oak High School student. It should have never happened, and yet it happens too much. When I first get police reports on my desk, I get them from the police department, and they give me witness statements, they give us 
uh, scene diagrams, all the information we need to make a filing decision on what type of charges we are going to file. And in this case, Anthony is going to be charged with one of two things. He could be charged with gross vehicular manslaughter while under the influence, or he could be charged with murder. A lot of people think of murder as something that just would never, they would never be charged with in their life because they would never go get a gun and kill someone. But in California, we can and we do charge murder for people who drink and drive and kill people. And the reason we can do that is because the law says that if you do an act that you know is dangerous to human life and you disregard that danger and you do that act anyways and it kills someone, you can be charged with second degree murder. And I can tell you that it happens all the time. It's 2019. Who does not know that drinking and driving is dangerous? Everybody knows it. And it doesn't matter how long Anthony goes to prison for, he's going to have to live with what he did for the rest of his life. And I wanna tell you that Anthony is not actually looking at 15 years to life if he's charged with murder. For each person he killed, it's 15 years to life. So now I didn't do great at math, but I can tell you that that is 60 years to life in prison. His life is, is done for him. For all the hopes and dreams he had, it's done. But at least he gets to live another day because the victims don't. And even if you get a lesser sentence and you get out of prison at some point in your life and you can go on and live another day, living knowing that you killed someone is a guilt that will mess you up because society is not forgiving. Can you imagine what it would be like for your parents to have to tell their friends that their child is in prison for murder? It doesn't leave you once you leave the jail cell. It sticks with you. But I wanna give you the information that you need to know so you can make those smart choices because I think sometimes we don't give you the information you need to understand but we give you a license. If I asked you what was the legal limit in California, everyone's probably going to say a .08. You're kind of right and you're kind of wrong. The legal limit is at the point that you are unable to drive with the same caution that a sober person can. Now science has told us that at a .08, everybody, it doesn't matter if you've been drinking for 40 years and you do it every single day. At a .08, everybody's under the influence but most people are under the influence below that. And for some people, that can be one drink. And now none of us are scientists, I am not, and even though I'm trained in this area, I know how hard it is to predict exactly what your blood alcohol level it is at any given point. So my advice to you, especially being under 21 is, if you're going to choose to drink, do not drive. They don't have to go hand in hand because the legal limit for people that are under the age of 21 is zero. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, I'm a good person, right? Like I make good grades, I am involved in extracurricular activities, I'm a good person. So if I ended up in Anthony's position, this is a reenactment, I don't really buy it, like that's not gonna happen to me because they're gonna say I'm a good person and they're gonna give me some probation. I'm here to tell you that is not the case. I handle these cases full time all the time you will not get probation for killing people. And it doesn't matter that you're a good person. That's how every defense attorney comes up to me and starts the conversation. Okay, now Ms. Pace, I, I just want you to know my client is a good person. I would be a rich, rich woman if I had a dollar for every time I heard that. Good people commit these crimes because they're making selfish choices. All you need to commit this crime is alcohol, and a car. And it doesn't matter how good of a person you are, it can happen in a matter of an instant. And I see it every single day. I have a caseload back in my office of 40 cases. And I only deal with cases that happen in our Southwest region and then our Mid County region. So that should tell you how frequently it does happen. There was once a vic uh, victim in a case, and at the end of every case, much like the parents did, 
victims' families will get up and they will talk about how the death of their loved one has affected them and what sentence they want to have happen. But the one thing that this victim said, and he actually survived, he was hit at 100 miles an hour, and the force of the collision was so bad that he was seat belted, but everything in his car bent, his seat belt broke, and he was ejected from his vehicle. And somehow, the grace of God saved him because he lived to come and tell his story. But the one thing that he said to me, I wanna to share to you, he said that it's a societal problem. We have created this world where alcohol is such a part of everything that we do. We laugh about it, we joke, we make jokes about how drunk people are. And it kind of lends itself to the situation in which we are here. We have to change the way we think about alcohol. Now this is not an anti-drinking program. I'm not naive enough to think that you are not going to drink in high school. Now those who don't, I applaud you. But I know that people are. But if you choose to drink, you need to be responsible about it. Because drinking, and if you ask your parents, you ask older friends, they will tell you, can be very destructive in people's lives. And when you get involved with stuff at a young age, you have no idea where it can take you. I work with a bunch of attorneys. And I'm, I surround myself with mostly people that have you know, gone to college, are good people, are not criminals, they're, they're functioning members of society. Yet, I know way too many alcoholics in my life. And the reason I tell you that is because when we, statistics show that if you start drinking at a young age, that the consequences and the things you have to deal with, the path you're setting yourself on can be incredibly destructive. And I don't tell you that to say never drink. I just say if you're going to make that decision, you need to be intelligent about what you're doing. You need to pay attention to what you're drinking. You need to be smart about what you're doing. And you need to not get behind the wheel. The thing that makes me happy to be here, because I really want to tell you what I do every day is sad. And I love my job, but it's very sad because I'm dealing with people in the worst days of their life. But being here, I'm happy to be here. And I don't say that in like, you know, I'm not paid to be here, but I'm happy to be here because it gives me hope. We can actually do something productive because your generation can do better and you can be better. You have Uber. I think Uber is going to save a lot of lives. I know it already has. Everybody should have it on their phone because if you can't get a hold of your parents, you don't want to call your parents, you don't want to call your friends, or you can't get a hold of them, you have that as a backup. And it's not just about you making the decision to drive your vehicle. It's also about you getting into other people's vehicles that have been drinking. I'm going to tell you it does not matter how old you are, this will stay true, with you, stay true for you your entire life. People who have been drinking or are horrific judges of whether they should be driving or not. That's why people drink, right? To loosen up, to kind of lower their inhibitions. But do not trust someone who has been drinking to tell you I'm just okay. I'm fine, I can get you home, it's a mile away, not a big deal. Somewhere along the lines in society, we have come up with this idea that two drinks, you're fine. For, two, for a lot of people, two drinks is too much. Make the choice not to get behind the wheel or to get into someone else's vehicle if you know they've been drinking. You have to have a plan when you're going to go out and drink. You know whether you're someone who is going to go and have a drink or if you're not gonna drink at all. But if there's even the slightest possibility that you're going to drink, have a plan for how you're going to get home and don't bring your vehicle there. I will tell you that because I've lived, I've lived life and I went to high school, I went on with life and you're about to enter the best years of your life. High school may be great for you or it may be really crappy for you, I don't know. But I'm going to tell you that when you get into college and you get into your 20s, it's the funnest time you'll ever have because you have freedom, you don't have the responsibilities that a lot of adults do yet. Do not rob yourself from those experiences because of a selfish choice. People who come into the courtroom for these charges are good people, but they are making selfish choices that will ruin their life. So I ask you to remember what you've learned over the past two days and keep that with you, because this is not just a reenactment, this is reality. 
and you don't want this to be your reality. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Pace. We'd now like to invite Ms. Davis, our guest speaker, to please come forward. Good morning, families, teachers and staff, administrators, but most especially to you students. I'm very grateful to be here and to share our family's journey through an experience that my eldest son is having. And when I think about this journey, I think about the phrase that I put up there, remembering your nobility. And so I want you to think about that as I'm sharing this story, because this is also our story, right? Not just our family, but all of us as a community. It's your story too. Because in our belief, we are all noble beings. And so with this idea, I never start a story without first. Introducing, of course, myself completely. So my full name is Imasumak Marañón Davis. There it is. Imasumak is a little bit of an intense name. It's pretty long. It's Quechua Indian. And no story starts without first acknowledging those who came before us. So I'd like to always acknowledge my ancestors on my father's side. My father is Quechua from Bolivia. And on my mother's side, her ancestors came two years after the pilgrims in New England from Ireland, and from Great Britain. And so this is also my son's ancestry, right? It's also part of who he is. Of course, we are more than just our physical ancestry. There's also a spiritual dimension to who we are. So as spirit people, we also have this part of us. This is one of the, the great luminaries from the East. And I love this quote because it reminds me of who we are inside, right? That this is in, that, that universe is unfolded within us. Just so powerful to think about that. And of course, I always think about the efforts of my ancestors. I always think about how they persevered, about their courage, about how they reflected on their choices and what they did in their life, how they never gave up and how they always held on to hope. And I share all of this for a reason, because as I move into my son's story, this is also his story. This is inside of him. This is inside of who he is, and he has to remember it. So my son is Kamal Marañón, and with his permission, I've shared his story with you because he can't be here today. My son, as, as all of us, has different aspects of who he is. He has a very kind heart. He has always been very concerned about how others are feeling and how others are doing. He also is a very loving sibling. He's the eldest. And in our tradition, he looks over the rest. And so he always made sure that he was looking over them and taking care of them. He's also a rule follower, which is such an interesting aspect to this story. Because this is the kid who, when we came home from high school, the first night of high school, and they give you a big packet and they say, read everything and sign it at the end, he read everything the entire manual, right, before I signed it. So he was very much a rule follower. And as a rule follower, he felt it was his job to guide his younger siblings. He also had a very strong element of being just and fair. It's something, again, that's very curious in this story. 
And so as my son was finishing his high school years, he decided that he wanted to be a marine biologist. He was really concerned about what was happening with the environment and the ocean. And in particular, he felt that the most misunderstood animal is the one that we were most terrified of, which is the shark. And he said, mom, that's the one we should learn the most about. And so my son entered into adulthood. And he worked part-time at UPS while he was in college. And when he turned 21, he asked me something. He asked me, let's see if it shows up. He asked me if he could go to Vegas. It's, a, it's a, something that this country does where you, at 21, you, people say, well, let's go to Vegas. And he said, Mom, he said, you know, I've never done anything like this. I've never been crazy like this. As a family, we don't drink. And he said, I was invited. I want to go to Vegas. And I told my son, it's not our tradition. You don't have to do it. And he said, Mom, I've never done anything crazy like this. And he's 21, and so he went to Vegas. When he came back, I asked him how it went. And he said, I didn't like that I liked it so much. And so my response was, then don't worry about it, don't do it again. Now see, I was naive at that time to how powerful and forceful alcohol can be in some lives. And I didn't understand the struggle he was getting ready to walk into. And because of the shame that he carried around that struggle, he went underground and he didn't ask for help. He didn't talk to us about what was happening for him. And these are his words. This is what he tells me. So on his 23rd birthday, we celebrated as we usually do as a family at home. And then that evening, he decided to go out with some friends as well and celebrate. And what my son tells me when I ask him, I said, I'm going to speak with a group of high school students what would you like me to share with them? And my son asks that I share with you the one moment that changed everything. He and his best friend decided that evening they were going to walk to where they wanted to go have their party and hang out, right? My son said, I can't drive. It's the, he, he already understood that that was not going to be a good option for him. And his best friend said, that's great. I don't have to drive either. We can just walk. And then in the last minute, they got a phone call from two friends. And they said, we want to go with you. But we need you to pick us up. And my son said, tell them this. In that moment, I made a decision that changed everything. And my life completely turned left. Because in that moment, my son said, OK, I'll drive. And he drove his friends, and they went out. All four are adults, 23, 24, 22. And they got intoxicated. And on the drive home, less than two blocks from our home, they drove into an oak tree. My son's car curled forward. My son was buried under the car. He had his seatbelt on. So the seatbelt crushed my son's intestines, broke his clavicle, broke his right arm. His backbone had two fractures that ran just to the front and stopped right before the spinal cord, which is why my son can walk today. His best friend, who sat next to him, did not wear a seatbelt, was flown from the car and died. His other friend who sat in the back seat did not wear a seat belt, had to be airlifted, and part of his skull removed so that his brain could uh, breathe because he, it was swollen, and had to begin to learn to do everything all over again. And then the fourth friend wore a seat belt in the back seat, had a collapsed lung, three days later walked home from the hospital. 
When I went to the hospital, I was called to the emergency room. They said that he had to have surgery. And when I, I waited till, I had no idea what was going on, right? I didn't, I, he was in an accident, I didn't know what that meant. While he was in surgery, my husband was talking to the police, there was all these other conversations happening and I began to learn more. Of course, that's devastating. You're thinking about that family, right? I'm thinking about Noel's family. I'm thinking about the other young men. I'm of course also thinking about my son. There's so many stories that become involved in one event, right? And all of those stories are important and valuable and we have to honor them. And when the surgeon comes out and he, I ask him, I said, okay, so he's okay, it's all right. And he said, you know, when people come to me in the condition your son was in, they're not alive. I don't know why your son is alive. That was really powerful for us to hear. And as was mentioned earlier, it may have been part of what his, his journey is going to be for my son because it's, it's a difficult one. So recovery was slow. It was about two weeks of recovery. And when I say recovery, I mean recovery in the hospital, right? Because of course recovery will be lifelong. And that two weeks that he was in the hospital, between my sister and I, we were always by his bedside. Now I have three other children. It was very difficult at that time to be a present and available for anybody else. My husband, my mother, everyone else had to take over. My sister and I were completely dedicated to what my son was experiencing. But of course, as you've learned, another shoe was going to drop in this experience. And soon after my son came home, we were told that he was going to be picked up and taken to jail. And so within a month, he was picked up and he was taken to county jail, which began a two-year process of exactly what the DAs have shared with you of going to court every month and trying to understand and learn, also trying to be very respectful of the family that has lost a son in this entire process, right? It's a very difficult experience and you wanna really tread carefully and with a lot of love, but at the same time, you're also thinking about all the different people that are involved, right? And when my son went up for sentencing, he wrote a letter to the family, which the judge read. And in the letter, my son said to the family how deeply sorry he was for the entire event and that he would gra gladly trade places with Noel so that he might be here today and that my son instead would have been the one to have passed away. My son was sentenced to 12 years. It was two years of moving from um, first degree murder all the way down to where, where he got sentenced. And it was 12, he's now serving 12 years of which he has to serve seven and a half. He's currently serving, um, he just moved. He was in California men's colony. He's moved to Soledad. And when I speak with my son and I ask him, what shall we share? What do you want them to know? He says, it's important that they know that beyond the laws, which are also important, there is a responsibility that he owns up to and he, he must and he has to atone for choices he made as a driver. As a driver, you always bear responsibility. Intoxicated or not, you bear responsibility. So he has to own for that, and he does. But beyond that, my son says, 
it's important to remember that it's the heart that is suffering. It's important to remember that they're the heart of those you love that are hurt. It's important to remember that someone you loved was deeply wounded in this process, right? That's the part that really matters, is that interruption that takes place. He also has some advice about drinking. See, I didn't grow up in a home that, that we're, we, we drank, and so I didn't drink. And so my assumption was just don't drink. That's the answer. And my son said, Mom, that's not really realistic. Some people are going to drink. So if you drink, then one of the suggestions he has is don't take your car keys. If you don't have your car keys, it's not an option, right? He also suggests that you set up who's going to drive before you leave. So that person knows, OK, it's my job not to drink, right? Maybe like next weekend, you switch that person. So then somebody else gets to drink that night, and somebody doesn't. He also said, go with people that you can trust, that you know are going to make sure that they will honor that, that plan that you made, right? So today, as I shared, my son is in Soledad. He is involved in every program he can be in. He's applied for college again. He's trying to take online classes. He's trying to learn how to walk through that system. But most importantly, what my son needs to do is this. He has to remember his nobility in this entire process because he has to be of service because of this experience. And he has to do what our ancestors, all of our ancestors, yours too, he has to do what our ancestors collectively have done. They persevered, they were courageous, they were reflective, they never gave up, and they always hold on to hope. And with that, I'm gonna close with one of our sayings of our indigenous brothers and sisters, Aho. Thank you, Miss Davis. We'd like to invite the Great Oak Choir to come behind me. Hold on, we're not done yet. We're not done. We're not done. We're not done. <laughs> Jennifer Lopez, Tyra Banks, Robert Downey Jr., rapper Eminem, Shania Twain, Blake Lively, Kim Kardashian, Jim Carrey, Jennifer Hudson, each of them have something in common. None of them drink alcohol. Some never have, and others have been sober for years. Jennifer Hudson said that she was never interested in doing it. Jennifer Lopez was quoted as saying, it is really bad for your skin. No matter what the reason is, the reality is that it is illegal for you to consume alcohol till you are 21. The consequences, if caught, are staggering. <clears throat> Please do not be a statistic. Possibly the greatest challenge today for our youth is the use of cell phones while driving, distracted driving. We see it every day while driving to school. No call or message is worth taking someone's life for, or going to jail. Let's pledge today to keep our cell phones out of reach while driving and do not be tempted. It is simply not worth it. Oprah Winfrey challenged her viewers years ago to put their phones in the trunk of the car. Be safe. Be a true friend. If your friend wants to do something that may harm themselves or someone else, be a true friend, say no, stand up, rise up, and take a firm stand. We learned these past two days that our lives can change in an instant. It is important to express our appreciation to those we care about. 
I want to challenge each of you. I was going to do this right now, but for the sake of time, I want to challenge each of you today, when you leave here, to take out your cell phones at lunch and text someone that you care about and let them know that you appreciate them. To summarize, do not drink alcohol, do not text while driving, and express your gratitude to those you care about. Tomorrow is prom from 7 to 11 p.m. at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Do not arrive any later than 8.30. No one is permitted to leave before 10 p.m. Please be on your best behavior. Bring your ID, wear your shoes at all times, and be prepared to have fun. We ask that you please leave quietly. Thank <laughs> you.